Namaste and welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. So today we're going to talk about the reaction to Rama's monologue, which occupies most of the first book. So let's hear what people have to say. When Prince Rama concluded his speech, calculated to remove all ignorance from the mind. All men in the assembly had their eyes beaming with wonder. The hairs on their bodies stood erect and pierced through their garments as if wishing to hear the speech. For a moment, after their stoic detachment and in their eagerness, the assembly seemed to have lost their worldly desires and be rolling in a sea of nectar. The audience remained motionless like figures in a painting, enraptured with internal delight, having heard the sweet words of fortunate Rama. Rama, his eyes beautiful as lotuses, his face lovely as the moon, the star in the sky of Raghu's family, held his silence. So now, it's clearly revealed the purpose of Rama's speech was to remove all ignorance. What is ignorance? <laughs> ignorance has three phases, lust, hatred, and delusion. These three phases of ignorance are the last thing to go <laughs> when one attains enlightenment. That's fourth path. And when these three causes of ignorance are removed, one realizes the actual truth. That I am Brahman. I am nothing but the cosmic self. And that everything I experience is actually in me. And is mine. So, at that point, <laughs> everything changes. It's very subtle. But what it means is that the mind is no longer in control. That the mind, instead of being a master, becomes a servant. So, if one reaches this point where all ignorance is removed, that means the end of desire, the end of egotism, the end of ignorance of all kinds. Yes, egotism is ignorance. Desire is ignorance. All of these things cause us tremendous suffering, leading up to taking rebirth in the material world. And so we should be very grateful to hear this wonderful speech where Rama removes all these causes of ignorance, leaving us with our real self. So that's where this whole book is headed. That's what this thing is all about. And you're going to hear again and again, many speeches like this, many wonderful narrations of unknown pastimes and unheard of saints who will reveal the actual secrets of the cosmos and enlightenment. But to do that, you have to be ready and willing to take these truths in, to make them a part of you, to make them the stable ground on which you build your conception of yourself and the world. And of course, that's going to make necessary some changes. You're going to have to throw out some old ideas, some misconceptions about the world. And many of these are like gospel in society. Huh? Like the idea that the material world is solid and real. That material enjoyment and possession is the purpose of life that uh, acquiring power and influence and status in society is the real goal 
of existence? All of these are wrong and very foolish, part of our ignorance. So we can't really understand what enlightenment is like until we get there. A certain amount of faith is necessary. A certain amount of uh, suspension of disbelief. One should be willing to accept, at least provisionally, these radical views, huh? apparently radical. <laughs> They're only radical from the viewpoint of ignorance. They're only radical from the mentality that causes us to suffer and to be born again and again in this world. So actually they're simply normal, ordinary truth. But like so many things, we believe a different way and our beliefs ultimately cause us a lot of pain. So I would invite you to put some of your beliefs aside and at least provisionally accept some of these uh, viewpoints given in Yoga Vasishta, because they are meant for your ultimate deliverance. And if you take them like that, they'll be effective and bring you to release moksha. From heaven, divine beings showered flowers upon him with loud cheers and blessings. People in the assembly were delighted with the sweet scent and beauty of these flowers from paradise, filled with humming bees. When blown into the air by the breeze of heaven, these flowers appeared like clusters of stars, which, after their fall, brightened the ground with their beauty like the beaming smiles of heavenly maids. These flowers covered the court hall, the roofs of houses, and their courtyards. Men and women in the city raised their heads to behold them falling. The sky remained quite unclouded as flowers fell constantly from above. A sight like this, never before seen, struck people with wonder. The shower of flowers fell for a quarter of an hour, but the masters from whose hands they fell were unseen all the while. When the falling of flowers ceased, after the assembly was covered with them, they heard the following words from the divine beings in the sky. We have been traveling everywhere in subtle bodies as spiritual masters, siddhas, from the beginning of creation. But nowhere have we ever heard any speech as sweet as this. Even the gods, such as ourselves, have never heard such a magnanimous speech on detachment as Rama, moon of the Raghu dynasty, has just now spoken. We account ourselves truly blessed to have heard today this highly charming and wonderful speech from the mouth of Rama himself. Indeed, we are awakened and edified by attending diligently to Rama's truly excellent speech on the ambrosial bliss of asceticism, leading to the highest joy of men. So now, <laughs> does it still make sense to pursue sense enjoyment? Do we still want to be a slave to our desires, chasing sense enjoyment and possessiveness, driven by greed and avarice, consumed by lust and hate, and falsely claiming to possess and enjoy the world? I sure don't. <laughs> Because I agree with Rama, I agree that the best state of human life is when we are free from desire and false ego. When we come to that point in life where we can let go of all these different sense enjoyments and lead an ascetic life. Well, what does it mean really, asceticism? 
The word has kind of a bad ring to it in English. It's like self-denial. But the word in Sanskrit is tapasya. Tapasya is the means of self-realization. So even though the popular idea is that the more sense enjoyment that you have, the better off you are. Actually, this is completely false and backwards. I'm here to tell you, listen, I've gone into sense enjoyment completely. I've experienced everything there is to experience, with the exception of needle drugs, which uh, I never touched. But everything else, yeah, I've tried it. And guess what? When it's over and you come back to ordinary consciousness, ordinary life, ordinary being, it's gone. Any pleasure that you experienced or any wonder or any new perceptions or anything you've experienced as a result of sense enjoyment disappears as if it never happened. It's just gone. And you come back to the way you were before and nothing has changed except maybe you've wasted some time and energy and money. So after all that, I had to sit down with myself and say, maybe I got something wrong. Maybe I got the idea that peak experiences were the height of human pleasure uh, from somewhere or other. But maybe that idea was wrong. Maybe I even got the idea that enlightenment was the result of running as much energy as possible through my chakras. And maybe that idea is also wrong. Maybe the best thing for us to do is nothing. <laughs> Don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> Because that is actual asceticism. Not that, you know, like uh, the flagellants, you take a whip and beat yourself bloody. That's stupid. Hurting the body is just as ignorant as giving the body too much pleasure. Yeah, we need to eat, we need to sleep, we need a nice place to live, and maybe some good friends and so on. But the rest of it, completely useless. I'm here to tell you, I'm 70 years old. I feel like a young man. Why? I've been celibate for years. And I've been a vegetarian since I was 16. And I've traveled all over the world, researched all the ancient scriptures, and they all agree on one thing. Sense enjoyment is a waste of time. Of course, in Western life, we are so conditioned and so programmed by society. It's very difficult to give up this idea. But once we do, once we see past it, once we do a few experiments with fasting and celibacy and different kinds of meditation and so on, we discover that there's actually a hidden pleasure in withdrawal from sense enjoyment. Once you get over the craving, huh? it's like cigarettes. If you smoke cigarettes, I did when I was a young idiot. <laughs> I smoked cigarettes for about 10 years, I guess. And when I gave it up, oh, I had terrible cravings. But once those cravings passed, after about three weeks, I felt better than I had felt in my life. And I can say the same thing about sex life, and egotism, and possessiveness, and desires, huh? lust, hatred, and ignorance. Simply a delusion. So people all over the world are putting their trust in a false idea that brings them only suffering. And then when the suffering comes, they are deluded. They're completely bewildered. 
How is this suffering coming? I did everything I was supposed to do and still I'm suffering. So it must be God's fault. <laughs> no. <laughs> God wants us to be free. He wants us to be liberated. But because we already have the disease of greed and lust and sense enjoyment, he has provided a cure. The cure is karma, suffering, and rebirth. It's like until you get over it, until you drop the craving and tough out the withdrawal symptoms, you're going to continue to suffer. So somehow you have to change your views let go of the ignorant delusion that sense enjoyment is going to give you happiness and take up a different point of view. That's what Yoga Vasishta is all about. That's what it's for. It's here to guide us in this process of getting rid of this false sense gratification and taking up the process of austerity, tapasya, for self-realization. And I'm here to tell you, the pleasure of self-realization is beginningless and endless. It's utterly reliable, consistent, and firm. Once attained, it is never lost, unlike material things. So this is the real goal of human life. Becoming free from the false ideas and false activities that produce suffering and becoming situated in the right view of life and attaining the self-realization that results from it, which yields eternal pleasure without limitation without change and without end. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Karudakadinalgum Arunachala Shivam Yidam